Thank you very much. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. Sorry, I'm just closing down the various windows that I have open in front of me. Yes. So I wanted to thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. That's my pleasure. That's my pleasure. Lovely to talk to you. How are you doing? Doing good. How are how are you faring during the the COVID pandemic? Oh well, London has just been placed in a new highest tier of lockdown, and I think um, my husband was saying this morning that it looks as if we're going to be here for months to come, which honestly hasn't made that much difference to what we've been doing anyway because we've kind of been social distancing as much as possible, avoiding going out, except possibly once or twice a month to go and buy Nespresso coffee, you know, things, <laughs> things just to get out of the house. But we're obviously not going to be doing that. I mean, it's kind of I've hit our holiday, Christmas plans. We were going to have family come across, but that's no longer possible. So it's just him, me and the dog for Christmas and trying to stop the dog eating the turkey, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty much like that everywhere. Uh, we're in the same, I'm uh, in Chicago here, uh, and uh, it's pretty much in the same situation. Yeah, 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 and I'm, I'm sadly the world over. I think it's gonna, although we've got vaccines and they're saying, although we've got a new strain of the uh, virus, which is more contagious than the previous strain, it doesn't actually, it's not more lethal. Uh, it's just that it spreads faster. So I think it's going to be, even though we have vaccines which work and will work against the new strain, it's just going to take a, it's going to take months to vaccinate an entire population. Right. Um, so yeah, it, uh, yes. Anyway, it is what it is. It is what it is. Yep, that's for sure. Where well, you, you just gotta hunker down and bear with it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's begin by. Uh, Talking briefly about uh, your newest film, uh, you have a brief cameo in the upcoming horror film, Paintball Massacre. Yes. What, yes really mm. Sorry, what were the circumstances which brought you to that film? That's a really good question. I'm suddenly thinking, I must just have been, I think I got a message via Facebook um saying would you like to read you know would you like to read a script um which is how a lot of most of my stuff comes through um these people just reach out to me um and yeah and I, I just read the script now oh, oh this is fun um actually no there was a there was a better i think i was recommended because chris regan the writer i'd actually interviewed chris regan on my uh, chattering with Nicholas Vince's YouTube show a couple of years ago. And I think it was about six or eight months prior to this message that, because um, it came via the producer rather than from Chris, uh, I think the original, but who knows? That's how I remember it. I wouldn't put my hand on a Bible to swear that's exactly how it happened. <laughs> As best I remember, that's how it happened. Yeah. So I'm guessing you were probably uh, on set for probably only a day on that one. I sh yes, I think it was in fact a couple of days. Yes, it was, okay. you know, it was one of those in and out. But it, the great thing is because it starts at the beginning where the school, the school friends, so for those of you who don't know anything about Paintball Mass Massacre, um, which and you said upcoming, in fact, it's already out, it's available streaming. Um, not quite sure which services, but I'm sure you go to paintballmassacre.com, you'll find out. Um, it's basically, it's about a school reunion, uh, oddly enough, at Paintball. And uh, all the, you know, all the, all the folks gather in the hotel bar the night before to catch up. This is the first time they've seen each other in years. Right. Um, and Somerset the barman who I play chats to uh, one of the guys and uh, just has a little story to set to tell and gives them a warning um, about it's probably a really good bad idea to go to this particular quarry where the paintballing takes place but uh, yeah it's a fun role to do. Yes okay so uh, how did you get into acting in the first place so what what brought you to the business? 
I, I was a natural show off. <laughs> it's just like, I think from, you know, being a tot, I remember my mother um, saying that literally I would have been about four or five years old, something like that. We were up visiting Scotland and there was a, there were bagpipes playing and I just got up and danced and grabbed the girl from the crowd and danced. <laughs> I don't remember any of this, but according to my mother, this is what I did. Um, and I was always just really interested in theater and I just found it absolutely magical. I mean, you know, like all kids, lots of imagination in terms of playing make-believe and uh, so on and dress up and, and role playing and just kind of was always just fascinated and then went in, on to do school plays and amateur productions all the way up until going to drama school. Interesting. Um, you've also, you've tried your hand at directing a couple of uh, projects. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I mean, I've done three short, I always have to think hard. I've done three short films. Um, the Night Whispered was one I did uh, by myself, um, just to kind of, and again, this is because I was doing a lot of short films for independent directors in the UK, and I just thought, really should have a go at this. I was also interviewing a lot of them on my then YouTube show, uh, Chattering with Nicholas Vince. And I just thought, I really want to have a go at this. So I did The Night Whispered. And then an opportunity came along to work with a production company called Celtic Badger over in Ireland. And we shot a couple of short films in three days, literally back to back. Um, and those were, you know, really good fun to do. Is that something you want to do more of? Uh, I would love to. I've not done anything for, you know, not been really looked at it for a while because it takes money and it takes time uh, sure. to do these things. And I really wanted to concentrate on writing. And then that kind of put got put aside when I'm, because I've now been working since around about June, July on this, uh, this year on my new YouTube channel, uh, The Chattering Hour. Um, but yeah, I, I would really like to uh, write and direct um films because it, it's a fascinating process because you've got what's in your head that then goes down onto the paper that becomes a script and then you have lots of people who get involved with their own wonderfully creative contributions as well and i just like that idea of, you know i like the experience of working on set listening to people and just getting suggestions and working out problems. I mean, filmmaking is just problem solving, basically. <laughs> it's, it's like, here's what's going to happen. No, that's not going to happen because that didn't happen. Therefore, we need to go and do that. This, that. How are we going to get out of this situation? It's all, you know, it's really interesting. It keeps you on your toes. It's, yes, that's the truth. Um, <laughs> starting out in the business, uh, probably want what more people, most people want to know about is your, uh, what you're most well known for. Uh, you played the the Chatterer Cenobite yes. in Hellraiser 1 and Hellraiser 2. Yeah. Um, what do you recall from your time working on those films? That it was tough, that it, you know, that it, that it was physically very demanding. Um, there was all these, the, you know, there was the life cast experience that gone through, which I didn't actually mind. I know many people, uh, actors find it very difficult to do life cast because your entire face is covered with plaster of Paris and so on. Um, and then in the particular case of Chashra, I couldn't really hear, speak or see whilst I was wearing the makeup. So that made it challenging um, to do it. All that said, I just remember the laughter. I remember the great friendships that I've made over the years. Cause I mean, it's not just Hellraiser, there was Hellbound, the second one, Nightbreed, um, which made with the same makeup guys. Um, so I'm in touch with a lot of the, you know, the guys who've um who we I've just remembered I'm supposed to send a Christmas card to one of them that's why I was pausing <laughs> sorry Jeff if you haven't got your Christmas card I think I'm supposed to message you for an address <laughs> moved recently um so yeah I think it's the friendship and the laughter that I mostly remember from those experiences 
were you friends or did you know uh, Clive Barker before that film? How did you get the part? Yeah, I'd known Clive for about three years. I'd been modeling for him because um, as I'm sure your viewers know, Clive is an artist. Yeah. And um, when I first met him, we were I think, fairly shortly thereafter, he was um, painting covers for the UK hardback editions of the books of blood, his collections of short stories. Right. And I modeled for the front covers of at least two or three of those. In fact, there's a, I think it's volume four of the original. There's a portrait of me with my head open, seeing my brains and there are syringes dropping into it. Um, and then there's melted flesh and, and so on. And uh, yeah, and there's another image of me on the front cover of the first one with holding up a photograph of Clive with a knife sticking out of the top of my head. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's Clive. What can I say? It's Clive Barker. So yeah, I'd known him for at least three years before. And he just said, you know, Nick, would you like to be in a film? There may be some makeup involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, that kind of brings me to my next question. Mm. Uh, how was your experience uh, in the makeup chair? Uh, what was... Uh, how long did it take to... It, it was really very straightforward. Um, Chatter was very straightforward to apply. It was only an hour into makeup and costume because it wasn't actually glued to my face. Unlike female Cenobite, um, Grace Kirby in the first film and Doug Bradley playing Pinhead, uh, Simon Bamford who played Butterball and myself, our masks were just put on. And I was lucky Simon had a pull over the top, mine was slit down the back and it just went on like that. Then the, the, so the teeth went in and then the mask went on. So actually the makeup going on was very quick. I, apart from a couple of days, I remember they, they, they wanted to film me as early in the day as possible. And this came about because they hadn't filmed me the day before. Um, and they got to the stage like, let's get Nick into the makeup because we can just go. We don't need to wait for him to go in. We'll just go when we're ready for him on set. But of course, that turned out to be eight hour days of waiting in full makeup and costume and not being filmed because that's film sets. And I think it was on the third day they actually got to film me. Um, so the makeup experience itself was not too bad. It was just the struggles once you were in it. Right. A lot of waiting around with all that makeup on. <laughs> That's filming. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Filming. Um, Hellraiser was Clive Barker's first directorial job. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how was he to work for? Do you have any uh, interesting anecdotes about working with Clive that you'd like to share? Um, he, he's again, it's funny. I mean, the reason why I think there was so much laughter is because it always comes from the top. Clive has got a wicked sense of humor, um, and is a very funny man and a very dry sense of humor. I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head now, not really. I, you know, I think <laughs> I do think there was, yeah, I think there may have been some moments at which I started complaining to Clive about something. And um, the whole experience, he said, Nick, you shouldn't have joined if you couldn't take a joke. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I signed up for this. You're absolutely right. I put my name on the dotted line. Um, but yeah, no, he's just very funny and he's just a very warm um, personality to work with. Do you still uh, keep up with Clive? Do you speak with him? Yeah, we're still in touch. I think, you know, I think most of the gang are. Uh, you know, he's very good at keeping in touch with his friends. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Well, you also have played a very interesting character in Nightbreed. You played the Kinski character. He's one of my one of my favorite monsters from that film. Oh, thank you. I love I love your your portrayal of him in that. Um, it, did Clive give you any special instructions on on playing his character or how to bring him to life? No, it was, it was kind of different. It was a different experience to the Hellraiser one because when we did Hellraiser, it was a much, much smaller production. Right. And it was tiny in comparison. I mean, you can see it on screen with Nightbreed. You know, 
we moved, we, we filmed Hellraiser in a little small um, studio in North London called the Production Village, um, which is a tiny place. And then for Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, we moved to Pinewood. But then again, it was still quite a small production. I remember the set of Hellbound being in this vast studio. Uh, my memory is, oh my God, there's so much space. When we got to do Nightbreed, we were in a vast studio and every inch of it was covered. It was, I remember Midian, it was like a three story um, set. So didn't get to spend as much time. And it, I think with acting, film acting, and I've talked to a lot of people, um, I've had the, for, had the fortunate position of chatting with people like Malcolm McDowell, uh, for my new YouTube show, The Chattering Hour. And um, he was saying, as I've, as I've seen him mention elsewhere, you know, basically, you're kind of expected to know your lines and to have it all sorted out in your head as to who your character is, what their intentions are, because you've got the script. In terms of the actual practicalities of filming it, it's, okay, you're gonna deliver this line from here, this is the action and you just have to work with that, which is what happens on the day, basically. Um, funnily enough, about halfway through filming, I remember Clive started writing background stories for all the night, for most of the Nightbreed, which were published in a book called The Nightbreed Chronicles. But of course, I didn't get to see those or know anything about those until way after the film was released, uh, filmed and released. But yeah, so I think, you know, it was very much as an actor, you are expected to learn your lines, do your preparation of what the character is. If you, you know, depending on the size of your role, I mean, Clive had an awful lot of people to deal with. And of course, he was mostly concentrating on Anne Bobby, Craig Schaffer, who are the, you know, the stars of the movie. These are the people that he's seeing a lot of and spending a lot of time with. And again, the thing is with, with playing um, creatures on these films is you're in the makeup chair up, more or less up until the last moment. So I remember, you know, Kinski was a five hour makeup process. So I'd be in the makeup chair at four o'clock in the morning, walk on set at nine o'clock. Everybody else is already prepared. They were ready to shoot. So you get a few words with Clive and then you just go. What was your take on the, the Kinski character? Because he wasn't as, as menacing of a, of a monster as, as say uh, Pelequin was. Um, I, I, well, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, no. Uh, I was just curious as to how you felt his, what type of a character he was. Was he, he wasn't as, you know, quite as evil as, as... He's a wannabe bad guy. He's a wannabe. He's not a bad guy. And I think that this is part of the message of the film. Just because he looks weird doesn't mean he is monstrous. He can look like a monster without actually being monstrous and being evil and violent and aggressive. And I always think of Kinski as being this wannabe bad guy. Um, Cause you know, and, and I kind of like the dynamism between uh, myself and Oliver Smith, Oliver, sorry, Oliver Parker, who played uh, Pelequin. Mm -hmm. uh, he is, as you say, Pelequin is really, full in your face but Kinski is far more reasonable Kinski is more you know thinks more about the long-term future of Midian whereas Pelican is just meat it's meat for the beast he's all he's, he's, Pelic Kinski is thought Pelican is desire in that in those aspects that's interesting thank you very interesting did you uh have a, any opportunity to uh meet and speak with david cronenberg <laughs> very <laughs> briefly yeah, literally literally just to say hi <laughs> this is nick vince oh, this is david oh hi nice to meet you mr cronenberg and that was it <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah <laughs> well, i was in makeup so I, he never recognized me <laughs> right right <laughs> but i do remember standing in the corridor in um 
Pinewood Studios, uh, and Pete Atkins, friend of Clive, the man who wrote the script for Hellbound. Uh, I don't know if it, you know, it might be, um, Nick, Nick, come here, come here. And standing outside an office which we know, knew had been allocated to David Cronenberg. And we could hear the manual typewriter from Pete saying, he's writing Naked Lunch. He's writing the screenplay for Naked Lunch, which I always thought was terribly appropriate because he was using a manual typewriter. <laughs> yeah, that was the closest I got to Mr. Cronenberg. Okay. Um, uh, several years ago, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people are aware of the story of uh, Nightbreed didn't exactly turn out how mm. I wanted it due to uh, studio interference and and so on and so on. Mm. Um, but several years ago, there was a director's cut of Nightbreed and then the Cabal cut that was released. Have have you uh, seen those versions? And if so, what did you think of those? Yeah, no, I was I, um, definitely saw the Cabal cut. Did a lot of uh, went, attended a lot of screenings uh, of the Cabal cut when um, Russell Charrington was taking it on tour uh, and presenting it at film festivals. So I did a lot of those, and then was lucky enough to uh, see the director's cut. Um, so yeah, I, I'm you know, let's be clear. There was the theatrical cut, then there was the cabal cut. And without the cabal cut and the interest that was raised by all the people who uh, were involved behind Occupy Midian and you know, getting um, signing petitions, um, the footage would not have been found, which allowed the creation of the director's cut. Of the three, I prefer the director's cut because I know it's much closer to the script that Clive originally wrote, and you know I, I was able to that I saw that I walk onto sets, walked onto set seeing, uh, expecting to film. Um, so yeah, of those three, definitely the director's cut. Yes, um, it it widens the film so much she gives such a, a greater understanding of mm -hmm. midian and the nightbreed themselves uh it, yeah. it, it's a more more perfect film for towards his his vision of of what nightbreed should have been yes yes absolutely absolutely um so out of your your three of your earlier films Hellraiser, Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, and Nightbreed. Um, did you ever think that those films would become so popular with fans and resonate so much with fans, even to, to this very day? No, I suppose the first inkling I got was when I was invited to the 10-year anniversary of Hellraiser in Boston. Um, and that was my first ever horror convention. And it was like, oh, these people want my autograph because, you know, I made a film and I'm signing photographs. This is extraordinary. Because um, no idea. Because I think when we filmed it, there weren't there weren't really horror convention films, conventions um, that I was aware of. Um, so no, at the time, I had no idea. And now, of course, I'm just blown away by it all and uh, and terribly, terribly grateful to all these lovely people that I've met, you know, wonderful friendships that I've created with certain fans over the years. Um, I've got friends now in Paris and America, all through just meeting them at conventions and so on. So, yeah, it's brilliant. Well, that's great. Um, have you done many conventions? Obviously, before the pandemic. but Yeah, uh... yeah none, none since. Okay. <laughs> No, obviously that's it. Okay. Um, out of the the Hellraiser versus Nightbreed, uh, which is your favorite film? Oh, that's a very good question. It's a really difficult question to answer as well, because of course, the first time you do anything, there's an excitement there. Sure. In terms of the character that I played, obviously I prefer Kinski over to Chatterer, 
because I could speak and run and I had lines and, you know, I kind of felt I was doing more closer to what I trained to do spending right. all those years in drama school. Um, you, you can almost see your face and can Yeah, see. absolutely. Totally and, and it's my chest hair and, you know, and it was, I, I went to the gym to build up that body. Um, so there's all, all that. And it, it's, it's, it is a very difficult question to answer because there is so much involved in those films. I think, this is one of the things that kind of unique about my situation because I had those three really big films at the beginning of my career. I then took a break from acting for about two decades and only came back in 2012. Um, and therefore have done and have done some great independent films such as Book of, such as Book of Monsters um, <laughs> since then and some of the stuff done, and stuff I've done with uh, Hex Media like For We Are Many and, and uh, The Black Gloves. Um, it's always difficult. It's like choosing your favorite child, basically. <laughs> I don't think it's, I don't think it's a, it's a decision that's easy to make or it perhaps should be made. But are those three films? Yeah, no, I can't answer that question. Honestly, I, 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 there's so many, there's too much involved with all of them. Right. Well, obviously, Kinski is, is a is a media role. So yes. Uh, yeah, more, absolutely. More to do uh, and to be seen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And since you've done, you know, numerous short films and, uh, and a few uh, feature length films, mm. Uh, and most of those are are geared toward the horror genre. Uh, mm. Do you feel like you're you're? Is that by choice, or do you feel like you've been pigeonholed? Um, pigeonholed. Um, it is kind of by choice. Um, it is it is the it is part of the arts that interests me most. I you know we're long before I met. Clive Barker, I was fascinated by horror films. Um, I was talking, I was chatting with Daniel, the actor Daniel Roebuck uh, yeah. the other day. Lovely, lovely man. And we had really fascinating and a huge horror fan himself. Yes. Yes. And we discovered that we both had the same book, of, uh, we both had the same book, um, Dennis Gifford, History of Horror Films from the 1970s. And I think, you know, that's kind of where it all started for me. And I used to make Aurora model kits, the, the oh, monsters, okay. famous monsters of moving. Um, and famous monsters of moving land, I think they were called. Um, so I, I was always interested in that kind of stuff. So to me, it's a natural progression. I mean, if somebody asked me to do something that wasn't, and it was a meaty enough, or it was an interesting enough script, then I'd be quite happy to do it. But no, I, re I, I really enjoy working with fans of the genre um, because most horror filmmakers are fans of the genre. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the great thing is you work with people. But having said that, you know, many of them, that's the way they get into the business and that's the way they start off. And I completely respect that. I was um, talking to Stephen, the director, Stephen C. Miller, the other day, and he was saying, you know, that his he always felt that he was more of an action film director, which he's gone on to do. He's gone on to work with yes. Sylvester Stallone and Bruce Willis. Yes. Yeah. You know, a great career, but he started in horror. And I yeah. think that is, you know, it's a kind of a gateway drug for many filmmakers right. making a, a horror feature film. Um, and that's great. I think that's wonderful. That means we get to see really very many talent or and I get to work with talented people at the beginning of their career which i think is always good fun you're right there uh, it horror is is definitely uh, uh an entry-level position for a great many filmmakers some of them which go on to bigger and better things yeah uh, which there's nothing wrong with that others mm. you know that's where their love falls and they stay in the genre and yeah. continue to make great yeah. things Either way, it, you know, it's it works out for the best. Yeah, yeah. So, Nicholas, uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Uh, you mentioned your your podcast. Uh, mm. What's coming up for you, and can you talk about your podcast a little bit? Yeah, you mean after all the plugs I've been liberally dropping <laughs> in during... <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm bad, I know. Um, it's just I have it's been, I've been having so much fun. Well, it's as I say, I've been chatting with Malcolm McDowell, Stephen C. Miller, and I can't possibly remember all the 13 guests that I've done in the first season. It, we started it on October the 8th. Um, it's produced by my manager, Chris Rowe. Um, so you actually have to go to the Chris Rowe Management YouTube channel in order to be able to watch it. Or you can find it on most podcast platforms. The easiest thing to do is to go to the thechatteringhour.com. Um, I'm literally just recording the trailers and uh, for this week's guest, which is being broadcast on Christmas Eve, and that's Chris Sarandon. Oh, okay. Um, I had a wonderful time chatting with him last week. Um, and a fascinating man. Um, and we've got, so this is, this is just coming to the end of season one, basically. We're going to take a, a, a break and we're going to be coming back uh, in the new year, um, starting on the 14th of January. Um, but other people, I mean, for this month, as I say, we were talking to Stephen C. Miller about his um, Christmas horror film, Silent Night. Um which is based on silent, you know, a loose uh, reimagining of Silent Night, Deadly Night. Right. Um, also chatted with Lynn Griffin from Black Christmas. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> really fascinating. Um, and I think that's the great thing is because kind of I'm an actor talking to another actor, you get a slightly different slant yes. on... Uh, on things, um, which is fun, you know, and I, I think people seem to be enjoying and really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I've been, I'm just terribly grateful for the chance to talk with, honestly, people who I've admired for many, many years, such as Chris Sarandon, Malcolm McDowell, um, uh, and, and some direct, you know, they are just fascinating people, really fascinating people. So yeah, so I've had some really good chats. Well, great. Congratulations on that. Uh, Thank you. Do you have any uh, film roles that you plan on working on in the future? Yes. Well, we've just, you, we've been talking about Paintball Massacre. Um, yeah. I believe sometime this week, they're going to be announcing distribution for a feature film that I did that was uh, screened at Fright Fest earlier there, this year called They're Outside. Um, there's also a film called Heckle, uh, which is out at the moment, uh, which stars Steve Gutenberg. Um, funny if I didn't actually get, have any scenes with him, but I, I've only got a small cameo in it, but they invited me back to meet Steve. So I got to hang out with Steve Gutenberg for a oh, that's good. <laughs> it was so much fun. Again, a fascinating man. Um, what else have I got? I've got... Touch wood. Uh, we've got another, something else coming in the beginning of January, COVID permitting. Um, so it's there out, as I say, there outside, literally the announcements I believe is going to be made this week about the distribution deal that's being done. There's Heckle. Um, can't help feeling I'm thinking I'm missing something. but Because be, I've been really lucky. There's been quite a lot coming out just recently. <laughs> For those of the two main ones there outside and heckle. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Not, so, touch wood, despite pandemics. Well, hopefully later on next year, it's, you know, it's not going to, it's going to take a little while, but hopefully once the vaccines get out and widely distributed, we'll get things back to closer. Oh, next. yeah. I mean, productions are still going on. We, we had um, articles. Um, in the newspaper this week about Tom Cruise shouting at his production crew. Right. Think, Quite right, Mr. Cruise. I'm sure people didn't do it deliberately. You know, apparently they were crowding around a computer screen and I thought, oh my God, it's such a natural thing to do. You want to show somebody something on a computer screen, you're yeah. immediately not going to social distance when you do it. Yeah. Um, but I can, uh, so I completely understand, I think, not really knowing the situation, I can understand how natural that might have been. Completely on Mr. Cruz's side, blowing up at people, and you can understand, his, you know, huge pressure on him as you know, star of the film, producer of the film, and trying to prove that it's safe to make films. Yes, 
you know, th literally thousands of people's jobs are relying on these things because it's hit the industry so, you know, it's hit acting. Because I was hoping to be doing a one a tour of my one man show, I Am Monsters, this year. Um, not going to be happening because you can't really do it without a live audience. So, yeah. But yeah, so I am, I think I'm very lucky because I do have stuff coming out at the moment, but that's not true for many of my colleagues. Well, that's great. And I look forward to uh, uh, seeing all those. Okay. Um, and uh, again, I thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Um, I'm a, I'm a big pleasure. fan, uh, uh, Chatterer, Kinski, <laughs> favorite characters. Uh, so I really appreciate it. And I just want to wish you and your family a very happy Christmas. And again, hopefully better things to come in 2021 after COVID dies down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me on, Michael. And the same to you. All the best. And everybody who's watching and listening, all the best for Christmas and for 2021. Yes. Well, thank you again, Nicholas. It was such a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much.